Uh, so I'll be speaking about uh, a very recent result with uh, my former student, uh, Xiao Tao, uh, who is at Duke now. <clears throat> um, Adris already uh, made a, a very nice introduction to, to the navier stokes equations, so I don't really have to add much. Um, so we're going to consider navier stokes on the torus uh, in dimensions larger than or equal to two, okay? Uh, in 1934, Larey proved the existence of, uh, of weak solutions that we now call larry hope solutions. So these are solutions that satisfy the equations in the, in the weak sense, and they also satisfy the falling energy inequality, or any t larger than or equal, equal to zero and any initial, <clears throat> initial time t zero. Um, for almost all initial time t, uh, t zero, and just a uh, just a few uh, just a few positive results. Uh, so we all know the Larry structure theorem, um, which is based on weak strong uniqueness. So in particular, it tells you that uh, if something goes wrong with your solution, it has to blow up from the left, right? Uh, it cannot just instantaneously blow up from the right without blowing, blowing up from the left first. Um, then uh, Prodian theorem uh, proved uniqueness in the critical LPLQ class. We'll talk about this, this class a lot. Um, <clears throat> so they proved that if there is uh, a weak solution in, in the critical LPLQ class, then every Larry Hope solution has to coincide with, with this, with this uh, this uh, solution U. <clears throat> also, maybe I should mention that uh, for Larry Hopp solutions, the Hausdorff dimension of the singular set in time is less than or equal to uh, one over two, right? And this result was, uh, was also extended to, uh, uh, to space time uh, by Schaeffer and later Caffarelli, Koch, and Nirenberg. Okay, uh, so these are Larry Hopp solutions. They're very nice, uh, but what we are going to focus, we are going to focus on a potentially uh, wider class of solutions that we call weak or mild solutions. <clears throat> Since we are on torus and we want to have some connection with Larry Hope solutions, we are still going to uh, start with all two initial data. Um, and the definition of, of a weak solution is, uh, well, is, uh, the standard, right? We uh, take that product with some smooth test function phi, integrate by parts, move all the derivatives to the test function. Okay. And uh, in uh, 72, Fabes, Jones, and Rivier proved that uh, this weak formulation that we are going to uh, consider is equivalent to the mild formulation. So if you uh, maybe modify your weak solution on a set of uh, measure zero, then it's going to satisfy this integral uh, formulation. Okay. Um, so this uh, class of weak solutions um, has been studied uh, quite extensively. Uh, Fabes, Jones, and Rivier proved a uh, local existence of weak solutions uh, for initial data in LD plus, so uh, LD plus epsilon, so here D is the dimension, and they proved the uniqueness of weak solutions in, uh, in the critical LP, LQ plus, um, where the, the boundary points, the boundary points are not, are not, are not included. Uh, later, Kato proved local existence of weak solutions uh, in the class uh, C L D for initial data in L D and uh, and the uniqueness the uniqueness of weak solutions was extended uh, to uh, to the to the boundary uh, regime uh, C C L D for uh, D equals to three first and then for all the dimensions later. Okay. So 
if we summarize, uh, if we summarize all these results, um, then uh, uh, we can uh, <clears throat> we can do it in the following way. So let's define XPD to be the critical uh, pro-decision space. So when P is not infinity, it's going to be uh, L, L, P, L, Q. When P is infinity, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be C uh, continuous in time uh, <clears throat> with the values in L, Q. And then the results can be summarized in the following way. Let's let D be uh, the dimension larger than or equal to two. And um, <clears throat> let's take a weak solution uh, in, the critical, in the critical space. And then it has to be, it has to be unique in, uh, in, that, in that critical space. Moreover, it's a Larry Hopf solution. And here I included, I included uh, both uh, boundary boundary points, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to show a very simple uh, simple proof, which is based on the um, duality argument by Leons and Masmudi. Okay, and uh, this this argument works in the whole in the whole Prodicerian regime, including including the uh, <clears throat> including uh, one and infinity. Okay, so um, what we are going to do? We are going to take a weak solution in the critical space. And then we are going to solve the linearized, linearized Navier-Stokes um, for V, right? Uh, to obtain an array hop solution V. So you can just do it by the limit of the uh, Galerkin approximation. Then we are going to consider the duality, the dual, the dual problem Right, so given any, any smooth function f, that's going to be the forcing, right? We are going to solve this dual problem for uh, phi. And it's, it's very easy, it's very easy to see that, uh, <clears throat> uh, that uh, phi, is, uh, phi, is, phi is regular because u is in the critical, uh, critical space, so it means the linear term in your equation dominates, so the linear term uh, kills the nonlinear term, and everything is everything uh, everything is fine. So uh, so we can use phi as a test function for uh, uh, for the for the difference between u and v. So our goal is to show that u and v uh, coincide, right? So if we use uh, phi as a test function, then immediately immediately we obtain uh, that. Uh, the integral of u minus v dot f has to be zero for any smooth function f. So this implies that u is equal to, to v, right? So this immediately proves the second, um, the second part of the theorem, right? Uh, that uh, u is a Larry Hopf solution. So we started with arbitrary u and we showed that it has to coincide with a Larry Hopf solution v, right? that satisfies energy inequality. And, and then the, the second part immediately, immediately implies the first one, uh, just by uh, prodi, prodi serial result, right? So if every solution in the critical space is a very hopeful, then of course, I mean, uh, they all have to coincide, okay? So now, now it's natural, natural to ask uh, the following question. So it's natural to ask whether this, uh, this result is, is sharp, right? So uh, the first question that one might ask is whether given uh, the dimension D and, um, and any arbitrary epsilon, uh, there are weak solutions of Navier-Stokes in the critical space for some P and Q that are right on the borderline of Prodi theorem. So two over P plus D over Q is less than or equal to one plus plus epsilon. Uh, such that they have the same initial data, but they don't coincide, right? And uh, the, second, the second question that one might ask is whether there are Larry Hopf solutions, so, so, uh, sorry, whether there are 
uh, non-Larry Hope solutions on the borderline of the prodecerin class. So again, given D and epsilon, is there a weak solution, right, which is right on the borderline of the of the prodecerin class, uh, such that uh, U is not Larry Hopf. And uh, both uh, <clears throat> answers are, uh, are yes, and that's that's what I'm going to try to uh, to explain in uh, today's today's talk. <clears throat> And uh, of course, uh, the construction is based on the on the method of convex integration. And again, Idris uh, made a very nice introduction already. Um, so there is a long history of uh, of results that led to the resolution of von Sager's conjecture. So starting, I mean, from from the conjecture itself um, in uh, fourteen in in um, in in forty nine, von Sager conjectured that. Uh, there is a critical threshold for the energy conservation for the 3D Euler equations. So it's uh, one, one, of, uh, one over three holder. Um, and then there were uh, the first examples of, of, of wild solutions by, by Schaeffer and Schneiderman so in uh, L2 in a space time and on infinity L2. Uh, and uh, uh, the Probably this is the first uh, positive result for the von Sager uh, conjecture was uh, was proved by Eink, and then um, a constant in E and T T proved uh, von Sager conjecture in the positive direct uh, in the positive direction by by reaching the critical constant uh, critical exponent one over three. Uh, later. There, were, there was an improvement by Duchon and Robert. And uh, in 2008, with uh, Peter, Susan, and Roman, we were able to reach the exponent one over three exactly. Uh, in 2009, Galelis and Sekalahidi introduced uh, the convex integration technique to the Euler equations and proved the existence of wild solutions in L infinity. And then um, they introduced what, what we call convex uh, integration type two, right? That we all love nowadays. Uh, and the exponent started uh, improving quite uh, rapidly, right? First it was one over 10. And then <clears throat> uh, Tristan and uh, Philip got involved and the exponent became one over three. Uh, first in infinity in time, oh sorry, one over five first, right? Then it became one over three for almost all time and then L1 on time. And then finally is that <clears throat> proved the uh, one Sager's conjecture in the negative direction by reaching the, the critical space. Okay. Uh, going back to the Nagy Stokes, uh, in <clears throat> uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Tristan and, and, and Vlad proved non-uniqueness of weak solutions uh, in the class C uh, L2. So by L2 plus, I mean, uh, by, I mean H, H, H0 plus, so with some, uh, with some uh, small regularity. And uh, this, this was, this was uh, the time when I ran out of excuses not to, not to learn the technique anymore. Right. And there were, uh, there were some uh, some follow-up results. <clears throat> and uh, what I'm going to uh, explain in, in details maybe, uh, well, at least I'll spend this a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about a uh, transport equation, about, um, <clears throat> about some results, um, uh, some uh, non-unique results for transport equation because for us it was it was something like a, a testing ground uh, of uh, of the method that I I'm going to explain. Okay, so transport equation that we all know, uh, rho is the density function, u u is given given velocity, it's uh, divergence free, so weak solutions are defined in a in a standard way. Um, and Leons. Uh, prove that for any P and Q um, <clears throat> and uh, velocity field in L1, W1, Q, divergence free, 
uh, and any initial data for uh, row zero and LP, there exists a unique renormalized solution in, uh, in CLP. Um, okay, moreover, if one over P plus one over Q is less than or equal to one, then this solution is unique among all weak solutions in the class uh, L infinity LP. So in particular, in particular, all weak solutions in this class coincide, okay? And um, there were quite a few results on uh, non-uniqueness for the transport equation. So maybe I'll just focus on the, on the latest uh, ones uh, where, <clears throat> where uh, the constructions uh, produced uh, velocity profiles in spaces like C, W, 1, Q um, for U and for, for O, C, uh, C, L, P, right? Uh, where one over P plus one over Q e, uh, is larger than uh, one plus uh, one over D, right? So a natural question is whether one can uh, remove, remove this one over D. So if you, if you compare the positive result with the negative results, right? Um, the positive result, on, result only requires you to be L1 in time. And for, for the negative results, for the most recent negative results, U was actually in L infinity in time. So a natural question is whether one can uh, reduce the uh, integrability in time and trade it for, for, for a better integra integrability in space. Okay, and that's that's what uh, that's what we did with uh, Xiaotao. So we proved the following theorem. Uh, so let D be um, a larger than or equal to three, and uh, P and Q uh, such that one over P plus one over Q is larger than than one. So you can be right on the borderline of uh, the Pernod Lyons. Uh, then there exists a divergence-free vector field uh, in L one W one Q such that the uniqueness fails, fails in the class uh, L1 LP for all. So basically uh, one can construct two, uh, two different solutions in this class starting with the same initial, initial data. And again, basically the idea is to uh, trade time integrability, right? So instead of L infinity, we go down to L1 as in the positive result for uh, for better for for uh, for better spatial integ integrability, right? Um, and we achieved this using uh, temporal intermittency uh, that I'm going to uh, talk about today. So maybe one uh, one thing I should mention that uh, uh, we had to uh, we had to pay uh, a price here. So for you, the space is optimal, but for uh, for rows. Um, for rho, the uh, temporal integrability is also L1. It's not L infinity, uh, even though this is this is not optimal. You can go above L1. You never try to uh, really optimize optimize this. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to go back to the uh, Navier-Stokes equations. So again, our uh, goal is to is to show that this uh, this theorem is in some sense um, uh, sharp. Um, okay, so this is the result that we that we just proved. Uh, so given the dimension larger than or equal to two, so it can be two, three, or above, um, and um, and p between one and two, not including two. Um, first, a weak solution in in the space LPL infinity of the Navier Stokes is not unique. Uh, in the class LPL infinity, if it has at least one interval of regularity. And second, uh, there exists a non larry hopf solution in the class LPL infinity with intervals of regularity, right? So in particular, uh, um, so the second part of the theorem implies, implies 
that uh, non-uniqueness actually holds on the borderline of pro-decision class. So there exists a, a weak solution with intervals of regularity. And then the first part implies that, okay, if such solution exists, then it's not unique. So this solution is not unique. <clears throat> so this, uh, this uh, shows that um, the, positive, the positive result is, uh, is, is sharp at least uh, at, one, at one point. So the pro, de uh, the pro decision line is, is sharp at least at one point uh, where um, Q, is, Q is infinity. Okay? And if it's still an open question whether the, <coughs> the pro decision uh, line is sharp at, at all the other points. Um, okay, so let me, uh, let me say uh, a, few, a few words about about the proof. Oh, so again, so this is, uh, this is actually the main, the main theorem, the main uh, construction. Uh, so let me, uh, let me say, say a few words. Uh, so the dimension again is larger than or equal to two. So we take any, any P and Q. Um, <clears throat> and uh, any positive epsilon, right? And uh, so V here is, is any, uh, any smooth function. So that's, you know, that's a starting point for, for the convex integration, right? We can always start with arbitrary smooth function. And then we show that there exists a weak solution of the Navier-Stokes and a set I, which is a union of open intervals uh, from AI to, to BI, such that the following holds. Okay, so the solution is, in uh, LP uh, infinity, uh, U is smooth on all the intervals AI, BI. So these are intervals of regularity for the solution. Uh, the Hausdorff dimension of the singular set is less than epsilon. So epsilon is arbitrary small constant. And on the solution U, um, is arbitrary close to the to the initial function that we that we start. Okay. So this is the uh, the um, the main the main theorem. So now maybe I'll just say a few words about about the the proof. So the step, uh, step one is to concentrate the stress error. So basically to produce intervals of, of regularity. Uh, so since, since we are going to introduce intermittency, so the building uh, blocks are going to be intermittent in, uh, in time. Um, this means that uh, most of the time, the error, the Reynolds stress uh, is, going to be, is going to be very small. Well, if it's, if it's small, it means one can, one can make it zero. Okay, basically we get this for free, we get intervals of regularity for free. Um, so again, so on each, on each step, right, we consider Navier-Stokes Reynolds system, um, where you satisfies Navier-Stokes with the, uh, with the forcing, which is a divergence of a Reynolds stress. And um, uh, as, uh, so the idea of convex integration, is to, is, to, is to make sure that the Reynolds stress uh, goes, to, goes to zero, for example, in L1 and space-time, right? <clears throat> as, we, as we add new perturbations to, to, the, to the solution. And I have to, I have to mention here that actually uh, the construction uh, works not only for Navier Stokes, it works for Euler equation as well. Right. So on the first step, we, we take maybe stocks or even Euler and just solve it, solve it exactly on, on small intervals. Um, and uh, since uh, the, initial, the initial data is always, is always smooth, all right, if the interval is, is very, very small, your solution is, is, going, to, is going to behave in a, in a good way, right? Uh, doesn't matter whether it's maybe stocks or Euler. Um, and um, at the end of the day, so once we glue all those exact solutions together, uh, what happens is that the new, new Reynolds stress is not going to be uh, much larger than 
the initial Reynolds stress. So it's going to be uh, less than or equal to the original Reynolds stress times some, uh, some absolute constant, right? So basically this procedure just concentrates the, uh, the Reynolds stress to, to small intervals. And again, so this, I mean, this is very, very simple. Uh, it's, we, didn't, we, didn't news, uh, we didn't use parabolic characterization um, uh, yeah, in this case, um, because again, because we are constructing an intermittent in time solution. So basically we are taking intervals of regularity for free. Okay. So now the second step, uh, convex integration in, in space time. So the building blocks are going to be Mikada, Mikada flows, right? Is a, uh, the simplest, probably simplest uh, exact solutions of of Euler equations that one can one can imagine, right? So we just take a pipe pipe flow is uh, with a velocity profile that has uh, zero mean, right? Um, and uh, the convex integration scheme, of course, is based on the on the on the idea that. Um, uh, the building blocks can produce backwards energy cascade. So high, high, low interactions uh, can give you a zero mode, right? So can give you a constant, and then one can basically uh, spread this constant using a geometric lemma to to kill to kill the Reynolds stress uh, that sits on low modes. Okay. So temporal, uh, temporal intermittency, okay. So now, so we are going to be uh, solving uh, Navier-Stokes Reynolds equations, right? So uh, again, the right hand side here is the divergence of Reynolds stress. So the goal is to uh, design a velocity perturbation, a W, right? That uh, That's going to, you know, at the end, that's going to produce a smaller, smaller NL stress. And uh, uh, the velocity perturbation is going to be equal to something which is very, very common in all the convex integration schemes, right? So we take building blocks, multiply them by uh, smooth functions that depend on the previous uh, Reynolds stress. Well, what we are going to do, we are going to multiply it by, uh, by an intermittent uh, function in time, g of t. Uh, such that the uh, uh, integral of g squared is, is one. Uh, and, um, and, and then we are going to show that then Reynolds stress is canceled uh, on average. Okay, the Reynolds stress is, is canceled on average. Well, of course, if it's canceled on average, there will be, there will be something, something left, right? Which is one minus g squared times r. So if G were just, just one, right, there would be nothing left, right? In our case, there is, uh, there is uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and this term is going to be, is going to be killed uh, by a temporal uh, corrector, which we are going to show is, is small because it's of, uh, it's of high frequency. So this is, uh, this is the idea. And maybe let me just say, um, I have uh, how much? Minute? I have five minutes, or even less than five minutes. Uh, let me uh, just say a few a few words about um, about uh, about uh, this procedure of concentrating the Reynolds stress in time. So, in some sense, it's it's quite similar to the to the first step in the construction. Okay, so let me let me try to draw some. Uh, and pictures. You can take the minutes, uh, Alexei, because we started a bit later. So, if you want to take ten minutes, that's fine. Oh, ten minutes. Oh, I don't even need ten. Uh, I think fine. you started at uh, okay, fifty, okay. right? No, I don't know, forty-five. Okay. Um, yeah, take I am, um, I'm almost done. All right. No. No. Okay. So, uh, so first, let me start with the function uh, function g. So uh, G, uh, so one can think about it as the intensity of the, uh, no, of the convex integration in space, right? Uh, so G is going to be 
so think about it as a function supported on a tiny, tiny interval. So it's highly, highly intermittent. Okay, it's highly intermittent. Um, and uh, we'll, have, we'll have another function here, h. So first, let me draw the, the graph of, of its derivative. So what we are going to do, we are going to look at uh, g squared minus, minus one. So this can be actually uh, g squared. So g squared minus one. Okay, so this function is, uh, is minus one most of the time, and it has uh, some uh, big spikes once in a while. So of course, it's going to be periodic in time. Okay. And um, so now let's, uh, let's, look, uh, let's look at the convex integration scheme. So I try to, I try to basically uh, uh, remove pretty much everything except, uh, except the, the skeleton or partial skeleton. Okay, so um, again, as it's very common in convex integration scheme, uh, the Reynolds stress is killed by the uh, high, high, low interactions. So first we produce a constant, right, using the building blocks, and then we multiply the constant by, uh, by some smooth function that kills the, the Reynolds stress, right? And then, uh, and then uh, what happens to, uh, to the perturbation? So this is the, the perturbation uh, omega, right? Uh, so what happens, uh, so this is uh, omega, omega times omega, right? Omega times omega. And uh, so the first, the first step is, is very common. So what we do, we just sub, uh, subtract uh, the, the average of the interactions, right? right. To, uh, to, to, kill, to kill the Reynolds stress up to, up to some gradient, uh, uh, up to some pressure gradient. Well, uh, in the temporal convex integration scheme, we have another another step. You also subtract the average of the of the function g squared, right? And uh, at the end of the day, uh, we get uh, we get two terms. One which is very common in a convex integration scheme, right? So this is um, this is a Reynolds stress which can be controlled. Because when we take the divergence of the building blocks, we get we get zero, right? It, it, this is an exact solution of Euler. And when we take you know derivatives of a, we get something which is not large because a is smooth. Now we get an additional term r times g squared minus one. So let me just draw the last picture, and I'm going to I'm going to stop. Right. So h. So one one way to think about the. Uh, uh, the temporal intermittency in, in this convex integration scheme is, is the following. So let me try to draw the graph of H. So H, uh, in some sense, represents the intensity of the, uh, of the temporal corrector, right? It represents the intensity of the, of the temporal corrector, uh, W, W, T. So when G is, uh, when G is zero, the derivative of h is just minus one, okay? The derivative of h is minus one. So what we are doing here, we are accelerating very, very fast. Uh, we are accelerating very, very fast and the whole Reynolds stress is killed by the temporal corrector. So the time derivative, the time derivative of the temporal corrector uh, kills, kills the, call, the whole Reynolds stress. So ideally, of course, we would we would want to continue this way, but it's it's impossible because h h gets large, and of course uh, there is another term in the time derivative that I didn't I didn't write because we have to use product rule, right? So at some point we have to uh, we have to stop and turn and turn around. So at some point h has to we have to start breaking, right? H has to stop and turn around, and this happens on a tiny, 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 tiny interval. And that's when we produce a, a very large new Reynolds stress. So again, so in some sense, we concentrate Reynolds stress on time, right? So on this, on this tiny interval, we produce a large Reynolds stress, which is then killed by, 
uh, by doing convex integration in space. Right, and then again, after we set H, we can again use acceleration to kill to kill the Raymond stress, and it continues continues this way. Okay, I'll I'll stop here.